to. Well, uh, they've got to drive in the fog, so we'll see if Marty wanted to drive. Here's, here's somebody coming. Raj and Edie, they'll brave the fog. But I understand Marty wanting to wait. She might wait till the service. Yeah. Being 90 years old and still driving is. I know, isn't that something? Yeah, it's amazing. And there's Corinne. What's that? Is she 90? Yeah, she's 90. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> How old are you now, Maury? 85. 85. Ah, you're still young. Yeah, yeah. Six another couple months. <laughs> Just getting started. Here comes Corinne. It's just such a nice morning to sleep in. It sure is. <laughs> the fireplace. And that would just get up to be in this <laughs> Get up, dress up, show up. That's right. That's when I get up. I woke up a little late. I was intending to get up about 7 or so. And I'm laying up there all at once. Something to say, you better get up. And I got up and looked at the clock 20 minutes after 7. <laughs> <laughs> morning we give you thanks we give you thanks for the breath of life for a warm cup of coffee for heating in a room for friends we pray Lord that you would be with us as we continue through the Gospel of John open the eyes of our heart extend to us your light help us to see hear our prayer now in the name of Jesus amen All right, last week we looked at sort of a parable in the middle of the passage. This week we'll probably get to the end of the uh, story, really, of it's always talked about the woman at the well, but it's really the story of the reconciliation with the Samaritans. I begin reading at verse 27. Just then his disciples returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want? Why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, come, a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. Cut scene. New scene. Meanwhile, his disciples urged him, Rabbi, eat something. But they said to him, I have food to eat that you know nothing about. And his disciples said to each other, Could someone have brought him food? My food, says Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are white for harvest. Even now the one who reaps draws a wage and harvests a crop for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper may be glad together. Thus the saying, one sows and another reaps, is true. I sent you to reap what you did not work for. Others have done the hard work, and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Now, back to the other scene. Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Now, as I mentioned before, over the last 20 years of biblical scholarship, they've noted literary structures in the Bible, 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, literary structures in the Bible that sort of help orient these passages. And you notice the repetition, he told me everything I ever did. That brackets this middle section that we looked at last week of the harvest. And the, the story is sort of intentionally framed this way to draw attention to the various aspects while not losing the flow of the story. So now we have this centerpiece which, as we talked about last week, just seemed 
why are we talking? You know, first we had water and then food. Why, why are we talk? Why are we talking about this stuff? Well, this is the the sense. This makes sense of the entire story within the entire Gospel of John. This is the Samaritan harvest. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with him two days, and he stayed two days. And because of his words, many more became believers. They said, then they said to the woman, now back to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. After two days, he left for Galilee. That's in sense the end of this story. Now, let's talk about, you know, we talked about the the rift between the Samaritans and the Jews. Just for the sake of remembering, where did that rift start? So let's, a little summary of history of the Jews. Just a little summary. Um, Israel. Where does Israel get its name? Jacob. Jacob. Jacob wrestling with God. And Jacob had 12 sons. And how well did those sons get along? Not too good. What indication do we have of just how bad, badly those sons got along? Then they sell one of them. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Joseph comes out with his coat telling them stories of dreams of how they're all going to bow down to him. And they had enough. So they beat him up and threw him in a cistern. And then Judah comes along and says, you know... There's no money in murder. <laughs> Let's sell them. So they sell them into slavery into Egypt. And of course, he goes through all of those trials in Egypt. Eventually, he continues to have dreams and he becomes what? Prime Minister. Prime Minister of Egypt. And there's a famine in the land and Egypt has all these stockpiles. And of course, the brothers come and they bow down before him, fulfilling the dream. Uh, on and on and on. They never quite trust him. So then after Jacob dies, the brothers sort of have a scheme and Joseph's like, look, you know, you meant this all for evil, but God meant it for good. And so in a sense, Israel settles down in Egypt and they're all one. They become slaves in Egypt and they forget the Lord and the Lord calls who to do what? Moses to, really, to bring them out. Moses to bring them out. And all of the rigmarole and God shows his power over the gods of Egypt, brings them out with a mighty hand and the Israelites then were so grateful and happy and obedient because God had done wonderful things for them and they marched to the promised land and it was happily ever after, right? No. No. It never is. It never is. <laughs> so they get out into the desert and it's a catastrophe. All these problems. And they, we talked about the snakes a number of weeks ago. They can't believe, they don't trust God. They can't believe him. On and on and on. They finally... You know, they get to the edge of the promised land, they send spies in, and what do the spies discover? There's a great land, but the people are big. There's a great land, and the great land grew big people. And we're like grasshoppers before them. We'll never be able to do this. God says, okay, back into the desert for 40 years till all you faithless, worthless people die and your children will inherit the land. The, one you, the ones you said would become slaves of the people of this land. So back into the desert, 40 years of wandering, 
And then under Joshua, they start to inhabit the land. They get a foothold. And at the end of Joshua's life, he says, now finish the job. In the book of Judges, do they finish the job? No, they don't finish the job. What do they do instead? Settle in to commingle with the people, and they get all caught up in the gods of the people, and on and on and on with all the trouble, and all the succession of surrounding kingdoms around the Israelites that keep making Israel was a slave in Egypt. Now they perpetually fall into slavery in their land. Okay, remember last week we talked about sowing and reaping, and so the Israelites would would plant their fields, they would have their herds and flocks, and what would their stronger neighbors come in and do? Take everything. Take the harvest. The Israelites would sow, and their neighbors would reap. And the sower and the reaper would not be glad together. And this, this long string of warfare and enmity in the land that's going on and on and on, and into the period then, you know, they had trouble with the Midianites and trouble with all the other neighbors who were sort of peers for them and God would send a judge and deliver them. But then the Philistines come in. And here's the thing about the Philistines. The Philistines are a people from the Mediterranean. So they are involved in a much larger world structure and they in fact have a technology that Israel doesn't have called iron working. And whereas before you could make a sword or, or a knife from bronze, and, but bronze is sort of soft and it dulls iron, you can get a good, you know, you can get a good edge on the thing and you can have good farm tools and good weapons and the Philistines are like, we're not going to let those Israelites have iron. And so Israel looks around and Samuel's sons are not up to the standard of Samuel, and so they look around and they say, we need a king like all the other nations. Well, who's their first king? Saul. How does that work out? Moses, or, or Samuel tells them, you'll get a king, but understand what kings do. Well, what do kings do? That's right. Sowing and reaping are still... The, the king maybe won't take everything that you've sowed, but he'll take some. He'll take what he wants. He'll take what he wants. And so Saul, who was supposed to be a strong man to overcome the Philistines, well, there's a matchup between who was the strong man of the Philistines. Big guy. Goliath. Goliath. Well, who's supposed to be the big guy of Israel to challenge him? Saul. So Goliath shows up. Where do we find Saul? Hiding. hiding in the tent. He was hiding among the baggage when he was first coronated. But there's this little shepherd boy who Samuel had, you know, had anointed on the, on the side. This little shepherd boy bringing his lunch to his older brothers. And he does what? Hearing about the Goliath. Takes him on. Takes him on. And... Kills him, defeats him. Oh. So David comes, and David finally releases Israel from the slavery of the Philistines so the sower and the reaper could be happy together. All right? And under David, well, David was from what tribe? Judah. Judah. This is the Judah that sold his brother Joseph into slavery. Judah, who had a change of heart later on because of an encounter with what daughter-in-law? Tamar. And so David now is king over Judah, is, is the ruler of Judah, but Saul is sort of, you know, after Saul's death, well, there's a civil war. And eventually, David consolidates the kingdom, and it's one kingdom together. And Israel, under David and his son, who's David's son that eventually rules? Solomon. David and Solomon, Israel reaches its height. They're united. They're one country. 
Solomon dies and has a son, Rehoboam, and, well, everybody's like, well, you know, Solomon taxed heavily. We had these glorious projects, and we had all this fabulous riches, but it cost us a lot. Rehoboam, can you lighten up on the public works project? Can you lighten up on the taxation? And what does Rehoboam say? That's right. If you thought daddy taxed you, well, what does that do to the kingdom then? They split up. The northern ten tribes follow Jeroboam. And the southern two tribes follow Rehoboam. And that sets in motion this long history of the kingdom of Israel in the north and the kingdom of Judah in the south. And on and on and on these two go. Sometimes they fight each other. Sometimes they collaborate. Jeroboam, of course, well, the key city in Judah is Jerusalem. Jeroboam very quickly saw that everybody trotting down to Jerusalem to do their sacrifices was going to be a problem. So he did what? He built two of them. We got one in Beersheba and we have one in Dan. And that way... Well, you know, convenience, so he can keep the religion and the kingdom together all in one. And, well, what does he set up in these? Well, you have gods, and so, well, you got a golden calf. Gold, not golden, but you got, basically, worship to the Lord, but the Lord is a calf. This reminds us of what? Aaron in the desert. So, so then we have this long history, and then the prophets start coming. And one of the most famous prophets is Elijah. And he's dealing with King Ahab and Jezebel. And Jezebel is queen from over here in Tyre. And, and Israel is all connected with all of the surrounding kingdoms. And you have good kings and bad kings. And, and Israel, Israel just can't seem to kick the habit of the Baals. And up here in Samaria, which becomes their capital, Ahab sets up a big palace to, to Baal. And so, you know, all these issues going on and on and on. And they have struggles with the surrounding nations. And then eventually, Syria or Aram is just north of them. And you have all this drama with them. But then a bigger, badder empire comes from the north. Assyria. And... Assyria's capital is, anybody remember? Nineveh. Nineveh. Now, Nineveh comes prominently into what story of what prophet? Probably everybody's most, everybody, one of everybody's favorite prophetic books. Yeah, <laughs> Jonah. Jonah is told to go from Israel to Nineveh and announced that Nineveh will be overturned. And that should make everyone in Israel happy because Assyria is putting pressure on Israel and making Israel her vassal, putting pressure on Judah, making Judah her vassal. And Jonah doesn't want to go to Nineveh and say it'll be overturned. It's like, why? That should be exactly what you want. No, because if God gives them a chance to repent, they might do it. And of course, in the story, they do. He doesn't want that. He wants Nineveh destroyed because Assyria, everything that Assyria is doing, Assyria is like one of Daniel's sea monsters and they're, they're eating the nations. Well, Assyria does eat Israel. Israel becomes no more. Now Assyria, all of these nations have to deal with exactly what the U.S. had to deal with when in the second Iraq war they toppled Saddam Hussein. We were promised we'd be welcomed as liberators. And we were for a couple of weeks. After that, what? They saw us as invaders. That's right. You're occupiers. So all these, all these empires had to figure out what to do with subjugated peoples. Well, the methodology that Assyria used for subjugated peoples was take people out of here, put them in the other lands that had been conquered, 
take those people out of there and put them in here. Okay, so some people remained. I'm sure some people fled down into Judah. Some people remained, but then new people came in from other places in the Assyrian Empire. Now, let's understand the ways of common religion, common, common polytheism in the ancient world. When Israel moved in and asked its neighbors, how do you make your crops grow here? Who sends the rain? Who makes the animals reproduce? They said, oh yeah, the God in charge here is Baal. Baal basically means boss. So if you want your plants to grow and your wife to have sons and your animals to reproduce well, send offerings to Baal. Baal's the one in charge here. So the Israelites sent God said offerings to Baal. After hundreds of years, though, of Israel following, um, following the Lord, people would move in. And what did those remnant who stayed in the land, what did they probably tell? The newcomers who moved into the land. The newcomers moved in and said, what does it take to grow food here? Some of them said, oh, you know what? Thank you, Marty, for driving in the, in the fog. Wow. <laughs> How'd it go? Uh, pretty good. Good. Not, good. Bad. Not bad at all. Good. It's pretty high. So, so the newcomers move in and, and they say, oh, well, you want your crops to grow? Worship the Lord. Well, that should kind of sound like a win, right? But they're not going to be trucking down here to Jerusalem to be doing that. And so they establish a temple in Mount Gerizim. That's where you worship the Lord. And whereas these guys had five books of the Torah down here, these guys had their own book of laws. And it wasn't all about, you know, worshiping down here in Jerusalem, you worship here. Now, so the Assyrians do this to the northern kingdom, but the Assyrians, their empire gets toppled by another kingdom, Babylon. Babylon comes in, and who does Babylon conquer? Judah. And what do they do? Babylon has a different assimilation practice. Assyria mixed up the people so they couldn't, you know, that's sort of divide and conquer, or divide them after you conquer. Babylon did what? How did Babylon assimilate people? What did they do to Daniel? Took the best. You take the best. You bring them up to Babylon. And you educate them. This is how America assimilates nations. What's our chief assimilation strategy in America for the best and the brightest of the world? Let them come in. Stanford, Berkeley, Cal Poly, Harvard, Yale, University of Michigan, University of Chicago. This is how we colonize the world. Knocking over petty dictators like Saddam Hussein, that can be done in a couple of weeks, but it's messy. It's much better to bring the brightest and the best of the world to Stanford and educate them in our ways. And some of them will go back and become the elites in their country and think like we think. It's very savvy. So Babylon does this. Babylon also destroyed the temple. And Nebuchadnezzar, the book of Daniel, all of that story. But then Babylon gets overturned and what empire then replaces Babylon? Persians. Persia. I'm reading um, Tom Holland, the, the book that I've been talking about, Dominion, um, which is a very interesting book. Or one of his earlier books, he likes, he writes these history books that sort of read like novels. He's very good at kind of storifying these stories. And I'm reading his book on the Persian Empire right now. Persia comes in. Persia has yet a different strategy for assimilating. And so when, when Cyrus began kicking over the first the nations up in his neighborhood, he 
basically had a routine. He said, you know, if you submit to me, I'm going to treat you well. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to tax you too heavily. You're going to worship your own gods. Um, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna treat you, I'm gonna treat you quite well. Now, if you take my indulgence, like when he conquered the kingdom of Lydia, um, he didn't go through and destroy the cities and take slaves and all of that. He said, okay, y'all can stay here and run your own kingdom, but pay your taxes and behave yourself and everything will be fine. Well, then Cyrus went back and they said, ah, Cyrus is gone, let's throw off the yoke. Well. That didn't go so well because Cyrus put down the rebellion and then went back and did all of those destructive, horrible things that he didn't do in the first place. Well, people saw that and guess what they learned? When you get conquered, take your medicine, behave yourself, things will be better. And this is how Cyrus built his empire. Well, Cyrus conquers Babylon and all these Jews are there in the Babylonian assimilation project and Cyrus says what to, to the Jews who want to go back because a lot of them didn't want to go back he says what to them and what does he give them you can go back and here's some help here's go back here's some money rebuild your temple you know Cyrus in terms of the gods said make a thousand flowers bloom Go back, rebuild your temple. Here's all the stuff Nebuchadnezzar stole. Put it back in the temple. Rebuild your temple, start your sacrifices going, and when your God is now happy and satisfied because his people are giving him the offerings and the sacrifices, of course he thinks like a pagan, when your God is happy, maybe he'll bless me. So you have all the different gods blessing him. And that's Cyrus' strategy. So Remnant goes back down to Judah, and they're going to build the temple. But now, during this, when Israel was falling apart and was taken, when Judah was falling apart and eventually was destroyed, the prophets kept coming in and they kept giving a message. What was the message that the prophets kept telling people? Because they're God's chosen people. This is the God of the whole world. Our temple's not supposed to be destroyed. God's not going to let anything bad happen to his temple or his reputation. What kind of God would allow that? So then the temple got destroyed. They needed to have an understanding. They needed a rationale. They needed a reason why God would allow his temple and his chosen people to suffer so much. Well, what was the reason? They have been unfaithful. They've been unfaithful. They, they're like an unfaithful wife going and sleeping around to the gods of the nations. And they've done this from the start. Remember when back in the judges' days, they've done it from the start. They've been unfaithful almost the whole time. And if you remember Ezekiel, even when Ezekiel is up there in the up there in exile in Babylon, what were they doing in the temple? setting up other statues, worshiping the sun. They were, they were polytheists like everyone else. And so if there's one lesson, the, the hardcore patriotic religious people of Judah got from the exile, it was what? You shall have no other gods before me. You will not mix in your, the other gods, the religiosity of all the other nations with true worship of me. You will follow my Torah. You will worship only me. We will not have other statues in the temple. Done. Period. So these people left Babylon, went back to Jerusalem, and they're finally going to establish a pure nation. We are going to worship only the Lord, we will follow his covenant. We will have no other gods before me. We are going to do it right. And if we do it right, what? God will bless us. God will bless us. And what does blessings look like? A good harvest. Good harvest. Secure borders. 
children, political success. We will once again, Zerubbabel will be a Messiah like David. And just like David put down the Philistines, Zerubbabel will put down the nations and all the other compromisers. Okay? So they get down there, they're going to rebuild the temple. Someone comes knocking at the door. Who is it? Hi, we're your brothers. You are? Yeah. Well, I don't remember you from Babylon. No, we didn't go to Babylon. You didn't go to Babylon? No, we didn't go to Babylon. We've been here the whole time. What do you mean the whole time? Where do you come from? Well, some of us kind of come from all over. And, and some of us were here, but we all got together and, you know, things are going okay. And I see you're building a temple. We got a temple. We got books. We want to help you with the temple. How's that sound? Do it my way. I mean, they want to do it, have them do it their way. Compromise? Are, are we gonna, are we gonna let the door open and allow the compromise of, well, they weren't pure-blooded Jews and they didn't have the right book of the law and they worshiped at the wrong place that this book never says to worship on Mount Gerizim. They just converted a high place over. God never told them. These, if we're gonna, we, 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 we learned our lesson about compromise and purity. We're not gonna, we're not gonna let the door open again and let these people in. And right away, the division start. And then they want to rebuild the wall in Jerusalem. Ooh, that's, that's, walls are really weapons. So, so read the book of Ezra, read the book of Nehemiah. Um, you know, at one point, people had been marrying into the people of the land and nope, can't do that. You gotta send all those wives away. And well, Judah's gonna be pure. Judah's gonna do what the book of Deuteronomy says. Judah's gonna finally do the right thing. And they're really serious about it because, well, after the Persians, then who comes in? Greeks. Kind of Alexander the Great conquers, but then Alexander the Great dies and some of his generals take over and well, those Jews, you know, those, they got their temple there, but they're not doing it right. What, what do you mean we're not doing it right? Well, you're, you're, you're just worshiping your little tribal God. You need to be a, a part of the great family of the nations. And we Greeks, we have math. We have architecture. We have philosophy. We have sports. We have all kinds of great ideas, and you Jews keep resisting us. Well, why are they resisting? What lesson did they learn? Be careful. One God, one covenant, nothing else. So the Greeks come in and are like, eh, you know, you really, you really got to really join the ways of the world. Well, some Jews are like, oh, okay. And others are like, you know, you know what's worse than a Greek? A Jewish traitor. That's what's worse than a Greek. And so Antiochus Epiphanes says, Psh, had enough of you stubborn people. I'm going to take a statue of Zeus and put it up in your temple, and now you're going to do worship the right way. Well, how'd that go over? Not good at all. The Maccabees family rises up and mobilizes a revolt, and what do they do? They kick the Greeks out. Oh, it's a Messiah. The Maccabean Messiahs, they kick the Greeks out. And the temple is purified. And for a little while, they have a little bit of autonomy until now who comes knocking? Now the Romans are sort of like the Greeks, but they're a really pragmatic people. And when the Romans conquer the Greeks, they're like... You know what? We know how to run government. We know how to conquer nations. But these Greeks got a lot going for them. And so they just kind of slide right into, um, they kind of slide right into the, the Greek 
you know, fragmented empire like a hand slides into a glove and like, well, you know, keep that, keep that Greek thought going. And, you know, a lot of the Romans gods are sort of the Greek gods now in Latin names instead of Greek names. And, you know, and you have Jupiter instead of Zeus and Mercury instead of Hermes and Venus instead of Aphrodite and shoot, Jupiter, Saturn, Mar you know, Mercury, Mars. Where where we name those planets from? Roman gods. Well, that's kind of funny, isn't it? All this syncretism we've got going here. Even teach our Christian schools, even teaching planets names of Roman gods. How dare we? <laughs> Oh, the Greeks brought their art, the Greeks brought all of that. So then the Romans, well, they conquered Jerusalem. Well, now the Romans are much more pragmatic because, you know, they, they learned what happened with the Greeks and they're like, do we really want to set up statues in that Hebrew temple? It's not worth it. And the Jews had done a favor for Julius Caesar, so the Romans said, look, you Jews, you're different, we know it. We're not going to bother you. You don't have to go to the local cult of the Roman emperor or the other gods. You get a legal exemption for your strange little religion. As long as you don't cause too much trouble, we'll sort of let you be. But it's not good enough for some Jews. It's good enough for other Jews. So they're kind of divided. Okay, so that's the Jewish culture war. But don't forget... Now, the Romans have conquered. You've got Samaria in here, and you have Galilee over here, and, well, where Jesus is. You've got the Sea of Galilee, you've got Capernaum where Jesus is ministering. Jesus does all this ministry here, and you've got Jerusalem down here. Well, how do you go back between Galilee and Judah? Go through Samaria, or you go around. Well, you know, you're, it's not a matter of driving a, another 20 minutes in the car because you're walking. <laughs> so this is the advent of this whole story. And, well, this is why Samaritans and Jews don't get along. This is hundreds of years. And the Jews are like, no compromise. This is how we stay together. And they've done it for, they're still together. I mean, where's, where, where's the temple of Gerizim in Sacramento? You got Jewish synagogue right down there. They're still going. You gotta, you gotta hand it to these people. The most stubborn people in all the world. They managed to continue to maintain identity through how much assimilation. It's absolutely amazing. But now Jesus comes down here, and this woman, who is of what status in her community? She says to the people, this guy told me everything I ever did. And what are they thinking? Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> story. Long story. Five husbands and the one you're with going to the well at noon. And then he might be the Messiah. All right, well, well, here's an interesting question. What is a Messiah to the Samaritans? We know what the Messiah means to the Jews. What does the Messiah mean to the Jews? Samaritans. No, to the Jews first. He's going to clean up this Roman mess. And, and God is finally going to validate our stubborn faithfulness to him by restoring the kingdom to Israel, which is exactly what the disciples ask at the beginning of the book of Acts. Now Israel will rule the nations. And when they're thinking rule the nations, they're thinking rule the nations like David ruled the nations around, or like the Romans rule the nations. That's how ruling the nations works. And Jesus is like, well... I am the Messiah, I am going to rule the nations, but I'm going to rule them in a different way. And I'm like, what do you mean in a different way? Ruling the nations, it's obvious how the nations should be ruled. 
They should be ruled with, well, sort of like Cyrus, kindness when you obey, but iron-fisted power when you disobey. Cyrus set the playbook. That's how you rule, and the Romans did that often. You know, get along with the Romans, you'll be fine. We won't, we won't let the other nations harass you like you used to live within. We'll make everybody behave. Well, more or less, because we're gonna, you know, pretty much give nations as political favors, which is how Herod got his gig, and how the sons of Herod managed their gigs. But this is, you know, this is what's this is what's going on. And Jesus says, I'm gonna rule in a different way. But well, here's the question. How will Jesus be a Messiah to the Samaritans? And how will that start? And what will that look like? Actually, it's starting right here. How is Jesus beginning to rule the Samaritans? And what kind of language does John use to describe what that ruling looks like and is? So, um, so verse 38, I sent you to reap what you have not worked for. Others have done the hard work and you have reaped the benefits of their labor. Verse 39, many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I ever did. Now here's a really strange thing that is built right into that verse. I was talking to I was talking to Dave Lindner, who used to work for Young Life, and I mentioned they had Young Life for a while had the cool kids strategy. Any idea what the cool kids? Young Life was was doing um, evangelistic ministry in public schools. Any ideas what the cool kids strategy might be? Get the cool kids, and the others will join. Bingo. <laughs> Get the cool kids to become Christians, and guess what? The others will follow. And that's very reasonable, very natural, very normal, because how do human beings work? We, are, we Americans, we like equality, but really, there's hierarchy. And you have the kids in school who are Usually, if they're boys, they're what? Athletes. Athletes. And if they're girls, they're Cheerleaders. cheerleaders. And everyone else kind of looks up to them, wants to be their friends. If you're a girl, you want to date these. If you're a boy, you want to date these. Yeah, this hierarchy develops. It's the smart, the beautiful, the strong. Greeks understood this. Well, young wife said, hey, you know what? If these people become Christian, guess what happens? The other kids. The other kids follow. Well, isn't that nice? Is that what happens in this story of Jesus and the woman at the well? No, just the reverse. It's just the reverse. <laughs> it's the woman at the well. And she says, he told me everything I ever did. And everyone in town is like, Oh, well, that's interesting. I wonder, it, she, I wonder if she wanted to have evil all these things. That's exactly what she wanted to know. <laughs> and, and the whole conversation with him is trying to figure that out. And on the basis of this, people start believing. Well, part of why they started believing was sort of, you know, magic trick is the wrong word, but... Jesus had the insider information that leads everyone to believe, well, he, he's, not, he's not just regular like us. That much is clear. And so they're motivated initially by sort of the same religious impulse that motivated, you know, people to follow Jesus in the Galilee. Well, he has power. Well, thing is, the cool kid strategy is really about power. Where does the power come from with the athletic boys? 
See the power displayed on the basketball court or out on the football field or on the soccer field. Or where does the power come from the girls? Our culture has so little understanding of feminine power. Right now in movies, they want to show powerful girls using the power of boys, and it makes no sense. The power of girls is beauty and charm and allure. People, that's, that's incredible power. Power of one boy is the power in his muscles. Power of one girl can harness the power of dozens of boys. Come on, come on, don't we know this? Of course we know this. Power, well Jesus has a different kind of power and they're all sort of allured to that power. Well, maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's going to do something for us. But then there's a transformation. So when the Samaritans came to him, they urged him to stay with them, and he stayed for two days. So they're interested in his power. Now, again, if... Uh, <laughs> we won't use Donald Trump. I can't. See, Donald Trump spoiled so many of my illustrations. Um, <laughs> cause I used to always say, if Barack Obama came to this church, you know... People would be like, oh, let's get to know Barack Obama. If Donald Trump came to the church, I'm not sure how that would go. Because um, does anybody really want to be around Donald Trump? Uh, I don't know. But, you know, so then I'd use LeBron James or um, we'll, see if, uh, we'll see how um, Garoppolo goes with the, with the 49ers if they go to the Super Bowl. or You know, th think about any high status person because of their wealth or their fame, or their access. We want to be in relationship with these people because relationship with these people affords opportunity. And that's normal human sociology. Jesus is going to overthrow this sociology, but it does, he doesn't deny it because people want to be by Jesus because of his power, because he told this woman everything she'd ever done. Well, that's power. But as we see in the Gospel of John, Jesus is also going to, at the same time, undermine this power. Why? How will Jesus undermine this power? This is a message of peace, not battle or anarchy. or a different message. It's a different message. It's a different message than just power. When they're talking about faith, Yes. Right. Well, and, and you know, the girl and boy power, when you're young, boys have strength and girls have beauty. But as we get older, what other kinds of powers do we develop? We develop lots of different powers. Wisdom. Wisdom. Exactly. We develop powers of wisdom. We develop powers of, of achievement. We develop powers of reputation. We develop powers of network. We develop all these other powers as we grow older, and we lose beauty and we lose strength, but we gain these other powers. And actually, these other powers are in many ways more powerful because all the little soldiers on the battlefield, usually young men, they have physical strength, but who's pulling the strings with them? The old guys. Or the old women. Queen Victoria. Cleopatra, you know, women have wielded that power for a very long time. So that's, that's power. But Jesus will come and, see, Jesus is, this is what I'm going to get into in the sermon a little bit, what I talked about with kindness and strength. Jesus' power changes everything because he's not only got this power, which clearly displays but he creates this power. The low status woman who might have used beauty or charm to, or maybe even other powers that are less agreeable, to try and make her way in the world, she's at the bottom of the hierarchy. And now she becomes the evangelist to the whole town. Now, it'd be easy to imagine she drops away 
at verse 41. And because of his words, many more became believers. If the passage had stopped right there, in a sense, this woman down here would have been nothing. She would have been just a tool used by Jesus to secure this kind of power up here. But verse 42 brings her back into the story. They said to the woman, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves and we know that this man really is the savior of the world. That's the climax of the story. He's the savior of the world. Okay. Here's a question. What on earth do we mean by that? He's the savior of the world. Well, you know, it makes this picture a whole lot bigger because, you know, when we were describing the history, it's always this little power here, this little power there, you know, and, and it's for certain people. But when Jesus came, this power is for everybody, but it's through him. That's right. Mm -hmm. and, it's, and it's not only the kind of power we see up here, it's also this other power down here. Because now, now the woman, not only is Samaria redeemed and the division between Jews and Samaritans healed, but the woman is redeemed and the division between the powerful and the powerless is healed. Well, see, that's, that's the way that Jesus conquers. That's the way that Jesus saves the world. Because we always want to use this Roman kind of power. This is the kind of power that is obvious and primary throughout the world. And it's temporary. And it's temporary. And this power creates what? Winners and losers, right? The top athletes, the prettiest girls, the people who are eventually wielding power through reputation and wealth and institutions and whatnot, that's all, that's all power from the top down. What does Jesus create here? Power from the bottom up. We're losers. And, and this woman... How is this woman a loser? She marshaled some power in order to get all these men. But that's not the power that Jesus esteems in her, does it? Jesus, in fact, calls her on that power, doesn't he? She says, well, send your husband and we can talk. I don't have a husband. Yeah, that's right, you don't have a husband. You've had five, and the guy you're with now isn't even your husband. Well, hmm, hmm. Morality is a certain kind of power, and in many ways it's connected with this power. This woman is a moral loser. Everybody knows it. In the cross, there's hope for moral losers, isn't there? Because when Jesus is hung on the cross, the cross is both an emblem of losing according to this power, but also losing according to morality. Because, well, morality is supposed to line up the world as it should go. When Job suffers calamity, all of Job's friends say what to him? You must have done something wrong. Because in a world of justice, good people get rewarded and bad people get punished. So if your fortunes are poor, you had it coming. The eh? book of Job says, eh, that's not so clear. Jesus hangs on a cross. Jesus looks like a loser in terms of that power. But 
What does Jesus do in terms of redefining moral power? No greater what has one man than to get lay down his life for his friend? Love. Love becomes the central power of the world. And love can manifest here, and it can manifest here. And you have just this tip of reconciliation between the village and the woman, right there in verse 42. Just like you had reconciliation between the Samaritans and the Jews. Reconciliation between the Jews and the Romans. Reconciliation between the rich and the poor. Reconciliation between the wise and the dim. Reconciliation between the beautiful and the ugly. Reconciliation between the men and the women. Reconciliation all over the place. Because you've got power from above and this new kind of power that Jesus creates here. So that Tom Holland guy who wrote the book that I'm reading right now in the Persians, I'm reading that book because I just finished his book on Dominion, which talks about this power. And this power has transformed the world even to the degree that people who don't believe that Jesus is anything special value his understanding of morality even when they can't explain it because it's all around us. The world is full of it. That's how we look at the world, through the cross, and we don't even know it. Jesus conquers in a really interesting way, and he's still doing it. And you see that in this story. And that whole history of Israel gets fulfilled in Jesus, and it's right in this story. Any comments or questions? Lil's looking for something. I know she is. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You got something, Lil, or not? No, not, not really. Because, you know, I, I had a question a few weeks ago, but I, you know, didn't mention I just kind of let it go. Time pass over. So, you know, when if you don't mind, when um, John baptized Jesus, uh, it kind of goes back to that, but was there something else involved in that? Uh, why did Jesus want John to baptize him? For this same reason of the cross. What Jesus shows in the baptism of John is this winning by losing. And that's prefigured in there. Now everybody goes out to John in terms of repentance, but Jesus doesn't have anything to repent from because he's morally perfect. And so why would he be crucified? Why would he undergo baptism? Then he goes, undergoes the water and when he comes up, the heavens open and the dove comes down and the voice of God says, this is my son, do what he says. Because this is the path to heal the world. So that's why go to John and everybody kind of watches and scratches their head. We'll talk about that a little bit more because we're talking about John and the Lamb of God. And we're going to talk about, see, the problem is Lamb of God has been around for 2,000 years. And so we don't think anything of it. It's just become language to us. God is about war horses. Lambs are about barbecues and sacrificial animals. And we look at Jesus and say, there's the Lamb of God. And right here, that's what this does. Let's pray. Lord, in this story, you do so much more than just simply show kindness to a woman who seems to not deserve it. 
you reconcile the world to yourself. Both the moral achievers and the moral failures. Help us, Lord, to continue to learn and continue to grow and continue to believe and continue to trust. Hear our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.